you are most welcome to this talk. It is Monday evening, the 29th of March. Bit of news from the United Kingdom and the United States and Europe. And tomorrow, the World Health Organization is going to be releasing its report on the origins of the virus. And we've got a sneak preview of that. Uh, don't hold your breath on that, but we will be looking at it. Now, just start off with co some contextualization for where we are at at the moment. Now, here we see the new uh, confirmed COVID-19 cases per million. Um, the UK is basically flat. Of course, New Zealand and Australia have been leading the way all the way through. Uh, Canada is going up and a bit of an upturn in the United States. More on that upturn in the United States uh, shortly. Uh, it is a concern. Europe. Well, let's just remind ourselves again. Th th this was the United Kingdom here, so re reasonably low. And that's the United Kingdom there compared to the rest of Europe. Now, thankfully, uh, our friends in Ireland, um, not too bad, but more cases than the UK. Germany worse, Austria worse, Italy worse, Sweden worse, France, Czech Republic worse, and Hungary with, with high numbers. So we are seeing this significant, really significant resurgence in Europe. And of course, this is driven by the new, the new variants. Now, um, let us go on to the sneak preview of the World Health Organization report. Now, this, is, this has been leaked by the, uh, the popular press. Um, to summarise this, as far as I can see, it says diddly squat, but it does have the advantage of insulting our intelligence. So let, let's look at this now. Um, so it's reporting tomorrow. Uh, now, the team hit the ground uh, pretty well, give or take, a full year after the outbreak. That there were there were difficulties in, in organising the, the tour, so it was a year until they hit the ground. Uh, a little late, you might think. Joint World Health Organization China report. This is the Washington Post article. You, 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 you'll find a. We'll have an official link to the full report tomorrow. But this is just a sneak preview. Uh, coronavirus most likely jumped from an animal to humans via an intermediate animal host. Well, get away. Um, imagine that. Um, I think we first said this round about, was it late January or early February last year? Anyway, nice that the World Health Organization's caught up with that. Downplays possible uh, possibility at least from a lab. Recommends further study, path of transmission between animals and humans. As far as we know, some quite elaborate further studies in, in other Asian countries. Um, this, of course, will be taking uh, attention away from uh, other countries. Recommended further study. Uh, transmission through frozen food. Now, we believe that tomorrow this World Health Organization report is going to say that the virus might have been transmitted around the world through frozen food. And Chinese scientists, of course, or, or some have said it didn't originate in China. It got to China through thro frozen food. Now, if the report says that, I'm probably going to be writing to my GP because you and me paid for this report via our taxes. And if this report is intimating that this virus did not originate in China, I will be deeply unhappy as you will. Um, does not recommend additional research into lab uh, leak hypothesis. Um, now, apparently the three labs in Wuhan that deal with viruses, but of course, none of them were, were, were leaked. Um, anyway, um, let, let's go on and see. Don't don't listen to me in my opinions. Let's see what other people are saying about this. Uh, U.S. Secretary of State, um, presumably well informed, concerns about the methodology and the process. Yes, I would agree. Uh, these are in italics, so the direct quotes. The fact that the government in Beijing apparently helped to write it. So good that the government's being helpful to write the report. A national security advisor, uh, it is imperative that this report be independent with expert findings free from intervention or alteration by the Chinese government. So we agree that's important. Uh, and this is why it's important to better understand this pandemic and prepare for the next one. So another pandemic could well arise out of China because of the way that they interact with animals. Um, there's no sign that that is going to dramatically change. 
So there's no reason not to expect another zoonotic spillover infection. Much data collected by the Chinese scientists ahead of the visit then analysed by the joint team. I mean, really, why didn't they just email it to them? You know, it's, it's just getting... Let's keep it cognitive. Uh, Australian microbiologists on the team. Um, I mean, yes, we did a three-hour visit. This is to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So they flew around the world, this expert team, and they did a three-hour visit. And it was sort of managed in the sense that there was a lot of people there and we did a tour. So that's nice. They had a guided tour around the facility. Uh, oh, they did get to ask questions. Well, isn't that good? They got to ask questions. Uh, you could do, if you so desired, a more detailed forensic examination. Well, this is the World Health Organization team that went there. And this implies that they did not do that. Why on earth did they go? Or more to the point, why did we pay them to go? Uh, but that's another whole negotiation and discussion. In other words, that didn't happen. So um, there you go. We'll, we'll, we'll check on the official, the official report when it should be released tomorrow. We're expecting it weeks and weeks ago, of course. It's been delayed. Um, they're probably trying to put it off as long as they can. Um, doing the credibility of, of uh, the team, and by extension, this is the tragic bit, the World Health Organization, no good whatsoever. So um, it, it, this just takes away from all the brilliant science that brilliant scientists do do in the World Health Organization because of these governance, governance issues. Right, um, now I'm not going to go through lots and lots of numbers from the United States today because we've, we've done that repeatedly. I'm just going to simply report something from the director of the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, this is a direct quote from her, Rochelle Walensky, uh, infectious disease doctor, of course, before her appointment at the, uh, the CDC. So seven day average above 60,000 per day, up 10% on the week, US cases. I'm not gonna show you graphs and lots of figures today. We've done all that recently. Death rate up by 3%. And of course, we know that there's a big delay in the death rate. So unfortunately, this means the death rate will probably carry on going up now for some more weeks. Hospitalizations also somewhat up. Anyway, uh, direct quotes from uh, Dr. Walensky. I'm going to lose the script and I'm going to reflect on the recurring feeling I have of impending doom. So she's left a script and she's being honest. Now, um, this is refreshing. Now, impending doom um, is actually a, a medical expression. Um, it's the sort of expression you would expect doctors to use. So if, if a patient feels they're about to die, we, we say the patient has a feeling of impending doom. It's like a recognised medical uh, expression. Um, we have so much to look forward to, so much promise and potential of where we are and so much reason for hope. But right now I'm scared. Remember, uh, she's uh, highly qualified. US trajectory mirrors the trends a few weeks ago in Europe. Not a direct quote, but this is what she's worried about. And we saw that worrying trajectory in Europe caused by the new variants. It's still a race between vaccinations and infections. But I would have thought a country would be wise to listen to their director for the Centers for Disease Control. Please hold on a little longer. I so badly want this to be done. We're almost there, but not quite yet. So are we going to see what is essentially a, a fourth wave in the United States, um, potentially? Um, are we going to see more deaths in the next few weeks? Al almost certainly. Um, she finishes off by saying... Uh, country does not have the luxury of inaction. So unfortunately, we had expected an increase in cases in the United States in March. It's just starting now. So it's starting a couple of weeks later than I, I personally thought it would, but it does seem to be starting now, despite the extensive vaccination campaign, which of course is spectacular. But it does seem that so many in the United States have let the guard down. Maybe Texas is leading the, the way in that. Uh, with the exception of Austin, which is uh, is more compliant with regulations, it has to be said. And also, whether you like it or not, 
and I know many of you don't, but um, it looks like it's being inevitable now, the White House is working on a standardised vaccine passport. Um, governments, this is going to be essential for international travel, I predict, and it's a case of how much it is essential for domestic activity as well. But we know that the, work out, the, the White House is now uh, actively working on that. Um, now, it, lots of people write in the comments that uh, they don't like this idea. That's fine. Uh, and you, you're free to do that, of course. But I know a lot of you don't like it. What I would like to know is, is what you want to do instead. Yeah, every time you don't like something, you have to say what you would do instead. So um, let, let's have suggestions of what to do instead. And I think it's going to be pretty well for sure this is going to be an electronic uh, modality of um, uh, vaccine passporting. Now, um, we had a, the Prime Minister's briefing today in the UK, so I thought I'd just have a look at the graphics. They are pretty good. You can actually download them all now, so I've kind of pinched them from the government website, so let's have a quick look. Um, number of people testing positive for COVID-19. Now, it's good, but basically it's now level. Now, looking at that flat line there what would you estimate the r value to be well i would estimate it to be one based on that line pretty well one okay there's a few percent reduction in the week but it's pretty well flat and i think it's going to go up in the next weeks and potentially month or two as the restrictions are lifted in the uk um next map so this is from the uh, Cabinet Office briefing room. They've just built themselves a nice new posh briefing room. Number of people in hospital with COVID-19. Good to see that going down. Also useful to have this line as comparison. Peak uh, of the first wave of the 12th of April 2020. So we see that the peak of the second wave in terms of hospitalizations quite a lot higher than the... Um, first wave now i had predicted this wouldn't be the case i got this wrong because i didn't factor in the great effect of the new variant the kent variant the b117 variant so that increase in hospitalizations there is due to the, the variant effect without that i'm sure we would have stayed well below the new variant has probably caused all this huge chunk of mountain here this this uh Iger of, uh, Iger of cases here caused by the new variant. Um, now, the, uh, the director of the Centers for Disease Control is aware of this, of course, and I think this is factoring into her anxiety. So that's that one. Uh, number of deaths, uh, people have had a positive test. So I think this is within 28 days of a positive test. Again, first peak, uh, first peak, highest seven day rolling average on the 10th of April. So again, as a result of the new variants, we are well over that. And without the new variant, we'd have probably gone to about there and then we would have gone down. Uh, instead, we've had to suffer, uh, endure uh, this appallingly high death rate. But the most recent uh, seven day average is uh, 63 deaths per day. So coming down nicely, but still not gone away. Now, this is the vaccination status, which, of course, is excellent. So the first dose we see uh, well over 30 million now, 30 and a half million or so. But we do also see that the second dose strategy is, is starting. Now, the government is quite clear that people who've had the first dose will be getting the second dose. This may mean that people don't get that some people in the younger age groups don't get their first dose for longer. This seems to be the strategy that the government is following. Hopefully the supplies will come soon. There's good news about extra manufacturing capacity in the UK. It's going to be here soon. A few months time we're going to be awash with vaccines, but not yet. Alas, not yet. So they're the second doses, which of course will carry on increasing. Now, this is a particularly useful graphic. Age distribution of COVID-19 deaths and cases. 
So obviously here we have the deaths. Now, th this line here is drawn at about 50 years old, isn't it? So most of the deaths above this age group, the vast majority, but tragically some, <laughs> some younger deaths as well. Um, total number of people diagnosed, we see more in the younger age group. And of course, under, under this red line here, um, no one is yet vaccinated unless they've got special risks or their healthcare providers. So I'm afraid we are going to see an increase in cases from this group because they're not yet vaccinated. But this group here is not going to be transmitting the virus to the older age group because they're partly protected and increasingly so as, as more of them get the second dose. But more importantly, this group here is not going to be transmitting to this group here. So they end up in this group here, the dead group. There's going to be much smaller numbers in here because they are greatly protected, even after the first dose of vaccine, from uh, severe illness and, and death. This is the great thing about the vaccination program. So that's very uh, encouraging in many ways. Now, this is uh, the cases in different age groups. Now, this is age two to school year six, which is 10 or 11. So we see in junior school, um, um, well, that's nursery school to the end of junior school. So age two to age 10, basically. Very slight. And, and there's, a, there's a new phrase that's being used in these conferences now. They're using the phrase uptick. So we better move with the terminology. There's a very slight uptick in the 2 to 10 year old uh, age group. Um, school, school year 7 to 11. So this is the 11, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So this is like 11 to 15, 11 to 16 year old age group, uh, a greater increase. Sixth form and students. Um, so that's, um, this is sort of 16, 17 year olds to uh, 24 year olds, slight downturn. So this is the main group where the cases have gone up in the secondary school uh, age group, the, the 11 to uh, 15, 16 year old age group. And of course, this was expected. It was inevitable, actually. And I'm just pleased it's not a bigger uptick than uh, we, I personally had feared. It's not as bad as I, I thought it could have been. So... Um, Yes, it's up. Yes, it can continue to go up. Yes, there can be more spread, but hopefully that won't result in deaths. And that's kind of illustrated by this graphic here. It took me a while to work this out. Now, what they're saying here is if you take 100,000 people in the population of the UK, how many would we expect to be hospitalised with COVID-19 in, in a four week period? So this is like, like if you live in a city of 100,000 or if you live in a city of a million, just multiply this by 10. But let's imagine this is a city of 100,000 people. Now, with, with no vaccines at all, uh, in a two-week period, and sorry, in a four-week period with the current infection rate, you'd expect uh, nearly 29 people in the 55 to 64-year-old age group to be hospitalised. Uh, 45 to 54-year-old uh, old age group, 21.2, 13.97 in the younger age groups. So that's what you would expect if no one were vaccinated. Now, this is if everyone was vaccinated. And this is um, vaccination just after one dose. So if everyone in these age groups had had one dose, of course, the ones that get two doses are going to have an increased level of protection against hospitalisation. But even after one dose, it's very good protection. So um, hopefully now most of this age group is vaccinated. So instead of 28.9 in a four week period in this city of 100,000 people would expect 5.8, 4.2 in the 45 to 54 year olds. Now, of course, because this age group's vaccinated now, it means we should be able to keep most of these people out of hospital. And we're vaccinating over 50. So some of these people are out of hospital. So what this means is we can expect that many from that age group in hospital, that many from that age group in hospital, but quite a few of these ones and quite a few of these ones. So what this means is because of the way the vaccination program has been rolled out, the average age of people hospitalised in the UK is going to become less. I think that's what that means. The average age in hospital is going to drop as older people are protected but uh, unfortunately still 
some young people are going to be hospitalised in this random city of 100,000 uh, people. So, um, useful graphics there, useful way to explain things. I think that's all, that's all helpful. Now, in the UK, of course, we're going through this process now of the reopening. Um, we've now gone to the 29th of March, so in England at least. Outdoor gatherings of six people or two households, outdoor sports now open. Meetings in private gardens, outdoor sports allowed. The next uh, significant restriction, uh, restriction shouldn't be lifted till the 12th of April. Now on the 12th of April, pubs and restaurants open for outdoor drinking and eating. Non-essential retail uh, open. Hairdressers and some public buildings and libraries will open, but not till the 12th of April. So this is another, this is another, well, it, it's not that long now, but it was five weeks after the original uh, instigation of stage one on the 8th of March. So it's not that long away now, really. Indoor leisure like swimming pools and gyms opening, self-contained holiday uh, accommodation opening, campsites opening. Still no indoor mixing between households. Review of uh, international leisure travel is going to be announced on the 12th of April. So will you be able to go on a summer holiday this year if you want to fly away? Probably not. But I'm saying probably not because of the high numbers of the cases caused by the new variants in Europe. Uh, funerals up to 30 people, wedding guests up to 15 as of the 12th of April. Now these will cause an increase in cases, but as we say... Uh, these increasing cases should not result in increased um, hospitalizations because of the protection given by the vaccines. But it is dependent on the government's roadmap. So we'll just finish with this today. Uh, the roadmap. So that roadmap, the reopening, is contingent on, on these four, four, four tests. Right, test number one. Uh, the coronavirus vaccine programme continues to go to plan. At the moment, that's true. April, there is going to be a downturn. Now, whether that downturn is sufficient to make the government rethink, I really, really doubt it. I suspect they're going to do everything they possibly can to carry on with the 12th of April uh, reopenings. Uh, second test. Uh, Vaccines are sufficiently reducing the number of people dying or needing hospitalisation. Well, again, that will be met, I'm sure, because the, the higher risk groups are, are now being uh, increasingly vaccinated and have been increasingly vaccinated already. Third test, uh, infection rates do not surge, uh, do, do not risk a surge in hospital transmissions. Now, note what this test is not saying. Infection rates do not risk a surge in hospital transmission. It's not saying infection rates stay down. So infection rates will go up. I think that's inevitable. They will go up, but they're not going to risk a, a, a surge in hospital transmission. So that will be met despite increasing rates. Despite an increase in the number of younger people that are in hospital as a percentage of the total people, of hosp people hospitalised for COVID. So unfortunately, more younger people or younger people are going to carry on being hospitalised for some time. But the overall burden of people in hospital is going to go down significantly. And the fourth test, new coronavirus variants do not fundamentally change the risk of lifting restrictions. That one is a bit more of an unknown. It depends on how much we want to fly around the place. Because these are going to come from overseas. So interesting to note, the government's prepared to accept increasing infections uh, as long as it doesn't risk a surge in hospitalisation. Well, I think that's us for today. Um, the more astute amongst you will have noticed uh, Winston's new mask. Uh, nice and flowery. Now, these he would like to, Winston would like to thank uh, Joan McPherson for making these masks, who sends them to us. Now, these are... Joan makes these the, the proper three layers as per the World Health Organization guidelines. And what she does is she actually irons on a third layer inside. And it's also uh, soft to allow for absorption of moisture. So actually, I think these are actually, re as well as being very attractive masks, they're really good ones. So jo Joan lives just north of me in the beautiful country of Scotland, where I was born. And so far, she's given away 1,400. She's made and given away 1,400 masks. So 
Joan, you've had my admiration and um, and especially as you refuse to accept any payment for them. So this is you know, pandemic's brought some good things out in people. So um, I think I'll, I'll wear that tomorrow myself. It's a very attractive mask. Good, excellent. So um, that's us for today. Thank you, of course, very much for watching.